All right. Well, thank you for coming, everybody. Um, this is today's talk session about the, uh, the upcoming uh, Japan Mobility Show and the state of Japan's auto industry. My name is Hans Greimel. I'm a member of the club here, and I'm also the Asia editor of Automotive News. Um, today we have two guest speakers with us, uh, Endo-san and Richter-san, uh, two of the uh, most uh, highly respected auto analysts in Tokyo. They're here to share their outlooks with us about uh, the, the Japan's uh, auto industry, its, uh, its attempts to catch up in the electrification race with a special focus on the battery electric vehicles, and of course, what we might expect from the Japan Mobility Show, which starts next week. The press days for the show, as probably many of you are already aware, are on uh, Wednesday and uh, Thursday of next week. That's the 25th and the 26th. The show opens to the general public on the 28th, and then it runs through uh, November 5th. So I'm sure that they would uh, love to have your attendance this year. Uh, auto shows have been in, um, in decline, I would say, worldwide lately. Uh, the Japan show used to be called the Tokyo Motor Show. They changed the name this year after a several year hiatus because of COVID, and they changed it to the Japan Mobility Show in an attempt to kind of uh, broaden the net of interests and industries that could participate with an eye to the future and try to get out of the old idea of a internal combustion engine vehicle and shift towards something that's more uh, uh, electrified and connected. So with that, I think I will turn it over to our guest speakers. Uh, Mr. Richter will go ahead first, and um, we'll take it, uh, we'll, uh, each of them will have a short presentation, and we'll do some Q&A. Thank you. Thank you, Hans, and thank you for, to the club for inviting me here again. It, it's always a really fun event to, uh, to join you here and, and talk about uh, an industry that I've been involved with for a really long, for, should I move this a little closer, for a really long time. Um, let's see. Is, is mine up here too? Oh, I see it. Okay. So let me just uh, make the screen big. Just make the. Uh, there it is. Keep moving that button around. Anyways, um, anyways, since you know, since we last met, you know, the um, the EV sales worldwide have continued to expand. Um, this is a graph that I do of the uh, annualized sales rate of EVs. It's sort of running something like about 16 million units now, which makes it about 18% of global sales volume. So it's really quite uh, material to the global auto sector now. China's still the, st the top market, but I think the biggest change is, is that as a percentage of total EV sales worldwide, um, the biggest place is the rest of the world. You know, for, uh, for quite, a, quite a number of years, it had just been about China, Europe, and a little bit in the U.S., but now, you know, around 20% of EVs are being sold in other countries. Um, China, which got off to a slow start this year because of a change in subsidy structures, is kind of back, actually a little bit above where it was uh, uh, at the end of last year. And in Europe, um, although EVs, are, it's another big EV market, hybrids still stay out in front, which is kind of good, uh, good news for our, you know, our friend here, uh, Toyota Motor. Um, and, in, and in the U.S., what's been interesting is um, hybrids have been pulling out again, and uh, plug-in hybrids have been gaining. Some people, I've, I, saw, I read somebody's news article the other day that was suggesting that it was due to pricing, but I think actually, um, I, had a, I had a meeting with Ford several months ago, and they started to talk about charging anxiety. And, and actually, when I, when I look at you know, hybrids and PHEVs, which are also expensive, um, that sort of makes some sense to me. Um, in Japan, the, the show is still about hybrids, uh, but it seems like in Japan, the small cars rule for EVs with the uh, uh, Mitsubishi uh, EV, uh, EK Cross EV and the Sakura dominating EV sales here. And so anyways, exciting times. I think the show is going to be something of a coming out party for the Japanese makers, because now you have quite a few makers that are talking very seriously 
uh, about their EV programs. I also think it's interesting that it, even as they are talking seriously, we're starting to see a little bit of backpedaling from some of their global competitors in the US and Korea. And that, you know, maybe in the long run it'll turn out maybe the Japanese weren't right to, or were not wrong to be a little bit more deliberate in making their EV plans. So with, you know, so I'll just stop it there. I'll pass the microphone over to Endosan, and maybe he would like to say a few words. Okay. <clears throat> Okay, uh, we are in Tokyo, I understand, but uh, I was in Detroit about a month ago to attend the Detroit Auto Show. And I arrived in Detroit on September 15th when UAW decided to go to strike. And it has been one month since they started the strike. And this is going to be the first strike in four years. And obviously, they are uh, demanding <coughs> lots of wage hikes and so on and so on. Uh, they started with uh, 13,000 uh, union workers with three, uh, three plants uh, in uh, Southeast, Southeast uh, US, and then spread it to uh, 51 uh, plants right now. And they are now involving uh, about 30,000 union workers at this point with uh, something like 55 plants or whatever. And I thought at the beginning uh, they just gonna uh, uh, stop uh, this uh, strike in, in the ways in the months, but mm -hmm. actually we are now at the day 45 today, and it seems that the, this strike doesn't really seem to be uh, ending anytime in the near future. The, the reason that I started by saying this uh, and mentioning this strike is that, again, there seems to be a growing uh, gap between Japan and the United States in terms of the wage. And obviously, you know, I went to the States and uh, I had uh, uh, ramen by paying like 30 bucks, including all those uh, uh, chips and so on, which is probably kind of ridiculous uh, price as far as Japanese is concerned. But again, that's mostly because the yen is now at 150. <coughs> uh, this is the difference between wage. Now, UAW uh, regular workers now earns roughly $32 uh, per hour and they are uh, asking for about $46 uh, within the next four years, uh, even though uh, seasonal workers, non-regular workers uh, in the uh, UAW now earns somewhere in between $50 and $20, and they are now asking to uh, <coughs> shrink the gap between this uh, 32 and 20. And Japanese transplants in the United States, uh, average workers now earn about $30 <coughs> per hour. The, the, the biggest, most serious question and the problems for the USB-3 is not this 32 go to 46. The biggest problem is this 15 to 20, <coughs> because about 60 to 65 percent of the e e workers working for USB-3 plants in the United States, about 60 percent are non-regular. So uh, they are now asking this $20 or $15 per hour to go to, not 32, but somewhere between 46 and 32. I don't know uh, how much of the demand uh, of those union workers can earn at the end, maybe $40. So which means that uh, seasonal workers in the United States at the US plants gonna go up from 20 to 40. And that accounts for 60 or 65 percent of the total workers in the United States. Well, obviously, uh, all those Japanese plants which do not uh, 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 participate in UAW at this point earns about $30, and there is no <coughs> no choice but for them to raise their wages as well if UAW goes to $40. But maybe 30 goes to 35, a little less than uh, uh, UAW's uh, uh, U.S. plants. But most likely, uh, many of the uh, U.S. workers are going to earn very close to 40 or maybe around $40 per hour, including both regular workers and non-regular. Now, at this point, if you go to Aichi Prefecture, visit one of those Toyota factories and, and ask one of the uh, uh, people working uh, in the assembly line how much are you uh, earning at this point, and then they're probably going to say about 3,000 yen. <laughs> So if uh, the exchange rate is 150, then we, we are talking about $20 per hour. So typical, typical uh, assembly line worker in Japan 
earns $20, and then typical or US UAW workers are going to earn $40. So as twice as much uh, the uh, Japanese, average Japanese uh, earns. That's going to be the um, wage if they, they come to the uh, conclusion uh, of this, uh, this uh, uh, demand dispute. So uh, this could start for as early as next, next year, maybe early, uh, uh, at the beginning of the uh, 2004, 24. So if, we, if that's the case, <coughs> well, as far as I'm concerned, probably average wages at the U.S. plants for UAW regular workers and non-regular workers probably is the highest in the world. Most likely, they're going to lose. Uh, their competitiveness because this uh, labor uh, uh, labor costs going to account for maybe 25 percent of the total production cost, so that's going to be doubled within the next couple of months. Well, that's probably the case. So, uh, <coughs> so why, why they are doing this? Well, they, as far as UW people is concerned, well, they they uh, argue that the other CEO and so on earns a lot, uh, uh, substantially more uh, than pre-2002, well, pre-2009 uh, year. I mean, in 2009, GM and Chrysler filed Chapter 11. And after they filed Chapter 11, practically speaking, went to bankrupt it. And then uh, a lot of all those um, you know, uh, uh, fringe benefits were taken out, and then wages came down. Uh, so on, so on. As a result, kind of their uh, labor costs were kind of normalized, so to speak, compared to other competitors. But still, uh, at this point, they are now asking once again a substantial uh, wage increase. Well, uh, Trump went to uh, Detroit, and then Biden also went to Detroit, and apparently they supported the UAW. So, UAW people uh, seems to be very confident with backup from current president or next might, might be the next president. So uh, that's the reason, and uh, if that's the case, maybe this uh, strike might continue for some time. Uh, Japanese seems to be taking uh, advantage of this because inventory by the, US, by the USB 3 seems to be getting lower and lower and lower. Every day, they lose about 5,000, 6,000 units uh, uh, production. And uh, again, 80 to 90 percent of the uh, portfolio that the, UAW, uh, the USB 3 is now making is either pickup trucks and SUVs. So uh, pickup trucks, well, there are only four makers making pickup trucks in the United States, USB 3 and Toyota. <laughs> and uh, everywhere else is uh, nowadays expanding their uh, 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 share in the SUV market. So uh, if uh, UAW continues to uh, uh, maintain these uh, strikes and uh, uh, they continue to lose 5,000, 6,000 units a, a day, then most likely their inventory level continues to come down uh, while Japanese might be able to take some market share away from those USB 3 in those very profitable areas. Uh, but again, it really depends. <coughs> uh, so uh, this is F-150, the Ford is selling in the United States, that, that top best selling uh, a peak of trucks in the United States, and this is gasoline. And all of a sudden, they started marketing this Lightning EV, that's a 150 EV version, and 65,000 US dollars, and this is 40,000 US dollars. And as far as I'm concerned, uh, not too many people are interested in buying this, <laughs> and they continue to buy this one. Uh, <laughs> Now, battery EV now accounts for 80, eight, only 8% 8 in the United States, even though obviously Tesla seems to be taking market share away from the USB 3. And they are about to uh, start introducing Cybertruck. That's the, um, I would say, very competitive EV pickup trucks uh, that many people are waiting. Uh, it seems that there is a rumor that more than 1 million units of orders are set already. Uh, so in that market, <coughs> maybe this uh, battery EV might continue to take uh, some market share away uh, from the gasoline or ice. But again, I was told uh, when I was in the United States, I was told that there is probably a bigger chance, maybe more than 50-50 chance, that the Mr. Trump is going to be the next president. <laughs> if that's the case, we could see kind of similar uh, impact when, uh, in, in, in compared to 2016 when <coughs> when uh, Trump <coughs> won from, from uh, Obama, Mr. Obama. 
So when we saw Mr. Trump took over uh, Obama's uh, desk, what happened was that uh, Mr. Trump kind of erased all the uh, all the measures, political measures that the, Mr. Obama uh, was was uh, uh, making, including all those uh, restriction of environment, higher uh, uh, fuel economy costs, and CO2 standard, all those things were well, all kind of taken out, and uh, and uh, uh, there was a kind of completely different direction in terms of uh, their uh, attitude toward the environmental standard. We could see the same thing. Uh, here in, in 2024, 20, uh, if Mr. Uh, Trump uh, really uh, takes over. I really don't know it. But uh, because of all those things, and by looking at all those uh, uh, battery EVs related uh, 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 policies, both uh, uh, in uh, China and the United States, I, I might be a little bit more skeptical about battery EVs. Uh, uh, no, uh, uh, ownership uh, uh, rate, uh, potential uh, growth uh, for the years to come, but again, it really depends on the politics of all those uh, nations. But anyway, I just mentioned the, the possible impact from the strike on the Japanese. Uh, by the way, I, just w one thing I, wanna, I wanted to mention, uh, that for this year, Toyota and Honda, those two, as well as Suzuki, those three Japanese are making record high profits, record high profits. And this is going to be the first year that the industry in Japan, automobile industry in Japan, their total revenue hit 100 trillion yen for the first time. That's the highest in the history. As far as share price is concerned, Toyota's uh, share price and Honda's share price is now at the record high since they were listed. So many of those uh, Japanese uh, top players, at least, seems to be doing an exceptionally good job, while there are many uh, players uh, whose uh, profitability is, is like one-third of the peak, uh, or uh, their share price is uh, only half of their peak. So there seems to be a growing gap between those uh, strong ones and the weaker ones, and that's also really depends on their strengths uh, in each of the market, China, US, maybe Japan, and the sensitivity to the uh, exchange rate as well as their uh, cost effort, and so on, so on, so on. So uh, they're going to be very interesting to see uh, what kind of new models they are going to uh, introduce at this upcoming uh, mobility show. And we are uh, going to suggest that the uh, which makers are going to continue to take market share uh, at, the, at the expense of some others. But that's what, uh, what we are going to see next week. So this is my brief presentation. Thank you very much. <clears throat> All right. Well, thank you, Endo-san, and thank you, Richter-san. Uh, interesting discussion. We covered a little bit about what's happening here in Japan and the global <coughs> uh, markets uh, regarding uh, the electrification trend and also what's happening in the United States market, which is, of course, a key uh, market, especially for the Japanese uh, players here. So I think uh, I have a couple of questions, including one from the Internet, but before we go there, uh, let's go to the floor here and see if we have any questions from the working journalists in the room. Any questions? Yes, Roger, go ahead. <coughs> would, you, would you like to come up to the microphone? I think sure. this might be uh, broadcast uh, online, in which case uh, it would help be helpful. Thanks. <coughs> Thank you, Roger Schreffler Awards. Um, I happened to be here in 1999 when and Schweitzer spoke at the club, and we got their the big boss, the Carlos Ghosn. But I get the sense, looking at the industry here, I just would like your opinion, that it really today is, I know you mentioned Honda, but, but it's Toyota and all the rest. It's the, the others don't seem to be significant players internationally to me, and I'm just wondering if you could comment. Sorry I'm giving you a loaded question. Well, it really depends on the, on the definition of significant players. <laughs> As I said, uh, for example, um, as no, uh, needless to say, this is the uh, top 10 uh, global oil makers by volume, uh, uh, even though, and, and then uh, here uh, we have two Japanese, um, uh, three Japanese, Toyota, Honda, and Suzuki, but in terms of 
market cap, and this is the value of the, each company, then <coughs> obviously we have Tesla at the top and followed by Toyota, and we have two Japanese, Toyota and Honda. Uh, actually, uh, Tesla is 2.9 times bigger than Toyota. At this point, even though at one time uh, Tesla was about four times bigger than Toyota. But anyway, at this point, it's 2.9 times. And actually, if you add BMW, Mercedes, and Volkswagen all together, uh, it's shy uh, uh, compared to Toyota's market cap. In other words, a Toyota's market cap is still bigger than Volkswagen plus Mercedes plus BMW. So uh, it really depends <coughs> on the definition of significance. As, as far as I'm concerned, uh, some of the Japanese, maybe not all, but at least some of the Japanese still doing uh, a good job, as I said. Toyota, uh, Honda, and Suzuki are making record high profits, blah, blah, blah. <coughs> and Toyota sales volume uh, for uh, 2023, this year, going to be probably about 10.5, 10.6 million, I think. That's a record high. And the last year, they sold 9.1 million. So from last year to this year, there are going to be more than 1 million added. More than 1 million added. So uh, if, if that's the case, I would say Toyota is doing OK, even though, again, as far as battery EV field is concerned, yeah, uh, their market share is less than 1%. So that's probably the point that many people are now kind of criticizing. Uh, we really don't know uh, if Toyota's uh, current aggressive, very aggressive, maybe some, some people say too aggressive, <laughs> Uh, volume forecast, uh, is that possible or not? But at least uh, after uh, Sato-san, uh, a new uh, president, took over the office in, in April, Toyota seems to be more aggressive in terms of disclosure of their technology and very aggressive uh, volume increase plan uh, as far as battery EV is, is concerned. This is just my assumption of Toyota's electrification uh, program. And if you take a look at uh, this uh, uh, <coughs> Uh, e. The E is the volume of battery EV that the Toyota is going to sell in the world up until 2040. Nobody knows what's going to happen in 2040. I understand that. Really depends on the regulations and each country's uh, uh, policymakers' decision making. But but anyway, uh, this is my current forecast. If that's the case, they sold uh, 24,000 units of battery EV last year, and they are aiming at 3.5 million by 2030, which means that we are going to see 100, well, more than 100 times of expansion as far as Toyota's battery EV is concerned. Is that possible or not? I don't know. But that's what Toyota is now uh, talking about. Tesla is expected to sell about 1.8 million this year. And BYD is expected to sell about 2.2 million this year. <coughs> so uh, 3.5 million, well, it's obviously seven years from now. So. Uh, they're going to be probably a significant growth for Tesla and BYD as well, but at the, but at the same time. The 3.5 million of volume increase <coughs> by 2030, why well, that you know, seems to be very, very aggressive based on their new uh, efforts in developing uh, uh, solid state uh, batteries as well as new platforms and so on and so on. So to answer your question, I think Toyota is already the second biggest, yeah, Tesla is 2.9 times bigger in terms of market cap, but, but still uh, uh, bigger than Volkswagen plus uh, Mercedes plus BMW in terms of market cap. And then uh, their sales volume, 10.8 million, that's obviously the, the, the biggest in the world. And then as far as their battery EV is concerned, we are about to see 100, 100 times expansion. Well, maybe we should give some little credit <laughs> to Toyota if, if they can really do it. But the question mark is, yeah. As a whole, as a whole, some some players seems to be completely out of battery EV, uh, partly because of the finance problem, what partly because of the technological problem, so that they have no choice but to depend on Toyota or some other big players. So, if that's the case, we might see all those small players could be could be uh, consolidated, whatever, uh, for the years to come. So, there's again, uh, as I said earlier, uh, there seems to be uh, you know, stronger ones and weaker ones, and the gap seems to be widening. But generally speaking, uh, I would say you know, some of the <laughs> Japanese players are still doing okay, I think. 
I would agree with a lot of what Endo San said, and I think you know, you know, part of the reason that the first off the Japanese make a lot of the Japanese makers look small in this market is just because Toyota is so bloody big. The other thing is, is Toyota has actually influence on a lot of the other makers. Um, Endosan sort of touched on the idea of consolidation. If you look at it, Toyota owns 20% of Subaru. Toyota owns 5% of Mazda and Suzuki. It has a stake in Isuzu. It has a stake in Yamaha. Um, things are changing with its relationship with Hino, but it has a big stake there. Um, you know, it completely owns Daihatsu Motor. So, you know, a lot, a lot of uh, the Japanese motor industry, you know, if you take a very liberal interpretation, falls under, uh, falls under Toyota. And, you know, that said, you know, you know, Honda's still a very significant player, not nearly as big as Toyota, but still $60 billion market cap puts it very comparable to a lot of the, a lot of the European and American makers. So it's a very significant force, not to mention it, it, it is a big kahuna in its own right in the motorcycle arena, where it is by far the biggest motorcycle maker in, in the, in the world and accrues a lot of its profits from there. So, um, you know, you know, so, you know, does Japan still have signif uh, significant makers beyond, beyond Toyota? Yeah, I think so, you know, very much, but the structure of the industry is changing. Very good. Any other questions from the floor? Yes. Thank you. Go ahead. Yep. Take it. Take a, a mic, please. <clears throat> Hi, uh, thank you for your time today. I'm Supriya from Bloomberg. Uh, my question would be uh, that one of the speakers mentioned in the presentation that um, probably Japanese automakers were right in their approach of by, you know, by not deliberately making policies for electrification. And uh, we know that hybrids are very, very popular in Japan. And as for the EVs are concerned, Sakura uh, Nissan's KEV is, is big in Japan. So my question would be, could, if you could expand on your comment on if they were right and why why they were right. Second, uh, uh, I've I've read comments online that uh, you know some European uh, from people from country European countries are saying why can't we have K E V such as Sakura uh, you know in in other countries. So why K is so big in Japan and why not they probably would do good in other countries as much as they are doing in Japan. So the K aspect and the electrification aspect, and if you could also speak about um, the, the, the status of uh, charging um, stations in Japan, because you know, it's, it's chicken or egg, like which comes first, there's no need, so there are no stations, there are no stations, so there's, there's no more EVs. So what's your take on that? Thank you. Okay, sure. Um, let me, let me, there was a lot, a lot to unpack there, so let me, uh, let me try, uh, try and do it. First year, um, your question about uh, K, why not, you know, why not in other countries? You know, you know, first I would say the Japanese K don't meet crash safety standards in a lot of other countries, so it's not a simple matter of, you know, you know throwing sakuras onto a boat and sending them somewhere else. Uh, that said, I, I did read a fascinating article that there's a lot of gray market imports of uh, uh, K trucks into the U.S. Uh, people in agriculture love them. You know, so you know that you know there there could you know there there is interest in it, but I think the deeper question is is there is a market for small for small EVs you know quick charging EVs because where Nissan and Mitsubishi took their inspiration from was from Wuling in China, which sells the best selling you know makes the best selling EV probably in the world. Uh, the uh, Guangzhou Mini EV, which again is a super cheap EV, much cheaper and probably a lot less crash worthy than, than a Japanese K car, but you know it sells in enormous numbers and because it's cheap. So it does say it does you know looking at it in two countries, there is a market for for cheap EVs. And the other thing that I would add to that is with the cheap EVs comes a smaller battery. So, you know, the, the charging infrastructure is not as big, uh, is not as big of a headache. The, the um, other, um, let's see, you talked about uh, the, 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 the Ks, the EVs. Oh, you were asking about charging infrastructure in Japan. And um, yeah, it's way behind. And, you know, and I even touched on it in one of my points about the U.S. vehicle market that, you know, um, hybrids and PHEVs, you know, like in the month of September, EVs grew, I don't know, it was like 57% year on year, which is pretty good. 
but hybrids were up 96% and PHEVs were up 108% year on year. And, you know, and I think, you know, and I do wonder if some of that has to do with people being, you know, put off in part by the price, but also by the availability of charging. So yeah, you know, chicken and egg problem. It's one that I don't think the industry in any country, maybe except for China, has done a great job of, of solving. Um, the, the third thing about, um, about Japanese makers going slow, um, you know, I mean, you can criticize it both, you know, you can look at it both, both ways, but, um, you know, we have had some costly missteps by Volkswagen, by Ford, and so, you know, maybe the process of going more deliberately might in the long term turn out to be the right one. The other thing I, I would, would say is if we look to some decades in, in, in the future, and if, if, if as some people say that ICE engines are gonna disappear and it's gonna be an all electric future, is you get into a situation where the normal product cycle takes over. And so some of the stuff that's out there now that's kind of new and shiny, when in a few years when you know other makers put other things into the market, um, you know, you know, will be the new and shiny thing. And so, you know, consumers generally tend to gravitate to newer models. So that could, you know, that, you know, is a, is a realm for A, the, you know, Japanese makers to catch up. And, and again, global EV sales, you know, 18%, there's still, you know, you know, 80, you know, 82% of the world that still has to electrify. So there's still a lot of room, um, I believe, to catch up. But I think it, you know, it was, you know, it was, I think main, you know, there was a lot of things it was driven by, but I think an important part mm -hmm. was the desire to differentiate and, um, you know, and not just, not just, you know, very quickly <laughs> throw a battery on a car platform and, and, and market something that isn't particularly differentiated. And now you're starting to see that differentiation process uh, coming, you know, Toyota's now talking about five different types of batteries <laughs> tailored for different types of user needs and affordability. And so that's, you know, you know, perhaps a, you know, a better thought out process. <clears throat> Good, all right. Uh, any other uh, comments, questions from the floor here in the room? Yes, please, thank you. Oh. Good morning. Nishimura, uh, freelance. Uh, as we see the trend, current trend uh, shifting from the uh, fossil fuel to the electric vehicles, uh, I think many uh, assets of car makers become uh, obsolete. Like uh, once I uh, visited a factory in Toyota, in Tomoko, Toyota, Hokkaido, they produced uh, a kind of uh, transmission system. Uh, like it's called CVT. Um, the EV does not need so, such a, uh, systems uh, in the future. So the key is the shifting the assets to the, to the electric vehicles uh, system. So what is, what is your idea to uh, make those assets uh, shifting to the new type of uh, cars? Thank you very much. <coughs> Well, what Toyota has been saying is multi-pathway. Multi That's what uh, their strategy to expand their electrification. What they mean uh, is that just depending on the battery EV might be dangerous. And it could be probably better off to have a number of options, so to speak. So it uh, really depends on the country uh, where uh, what kind of uh, policy maker is uh, going to do. Uh, really depending on all those uh, now kind of competitiveness, some support, incentives, uh, uh, their uh, energy uh, strategy, uh, uh, and all those, uh, all those things. So as far as electric vehicle or battery EV is concerned, probably we could see a, a bigger uh, market in China as well as maybe in some of the European nations, maybe in the United States, not as high as the rate in China or, the, or Europe. And then at the same time, we will continue to see relatively low level of the diffusion rate uh, in uh, rest, you know, all those kind of developing nations in Southeast Asia, Africa, and South America. And then in Japan, for with all those many reasons involving all those uh, 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 nuclear uh, 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 power plants. 
uh, we probably will never see uh, this uh, battery EV to take off uh, uh, to, to uh, you know, uh, take uh, at like 50 percent of market share. That probably will never happen, at least for the time being. Which means that for Japanese maker who, who has home home market called Japan, they might have some, or they have to have a couple options. Uh, this type of the electrification for this particular area, or this type of the completely different uh, uh, type of the vehicle for this market. And that's probably very difficult to do because you, you're going to have type A and B and C and D at the same time uh, to cover all the uh, global markets. That's obviously a very difficult thing to do. But at the same time, if that particular company can do that, then most likely that company might be very flexible enough, should be able to take advantage of each of the market's different, different uh, character, and they continue to do very well in terms of profitability and so on and so on. And that's probably what Twitter is aiming at. So by looking at my, my uh, scenario or simulation up to 2040, for example, in 2030, my forecast is that as far as ICE is concerned, about 5 million. As far as hybrid is concerned, 4.4 million. And battery EV, 3.5 million. Kind of well balanced, so to speak. And this ICE is most likely aiming at the United States, Japan, and some of the European nations. This hybrid is most likely Japan, as well as actually in China and some of the nations. As I said, recently we have, we have been seeing a significant growth of plug-in hybrid in China and the United States and Europe and so on. And then obviously battery EV going to uh, substantially grow from this point to, to uh, uh, 2030. So if you really bet on the battery EV, you just do only battery EV, you might be losing uh, some of the uh, volume market share in that particular area which is not really adapting on the battery EV system or cannot really adapt on the battery EV system. So I think it's going to be a good idea to have different boxes available for different type of the area and, and uh, population and customers. That's probably a good thing. So uh, to answer your question, yeah, I, I, I have visited Toyota's Hokkaido a number of times, and they are doing uh, 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 wheel as well as uh, you said uh, transmission and uh, especially a CVT and so on and so on, which obviously is not really uh, used by battery V, but at the same time, obviously going to be uh, uh, really essential for gasoline and and uh, hybrid uh, and plug-in hybrid. And actually, at this point, hybrid and plug-in hybrid has been still very strong and very popular. By looking at this, uh, hybrid and battery V, uh, that's a D. Area D, right? And by looking at D, currently they are selling about 3.5, 3.6 million. And my forecast is hybrid going to peak out sometimes in 2025. But we'll stay at relatively high level, stable at around 4 million plus, for up until all the way to 2040. Even though, as far as ICE is concerned, we are expecting the volume to peak out already. And then will continue to come down substantially to 2040, even though in 2040 they are still having or making 2 million units of ice. But at that time, battery EV is going to be 8.5 million. That's going to be, again, I don't know, 800 times <laughs> more than they sold last year. And uh, which company can really do this? And that really depends on what kind of technology they have, uh, how much of money they have, uh, how many of good engineers they have, or blah, 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 and how much of strong uh, dealership they are still maintaining uh, throughout the world. So again, uh, it's, it's not really zero or 100. Maybe a good idea to have this and this and this at the same time, if you can really afford doing it. That's my my answer, but again, I understand not uh, uh, all the people, all the company can do everything at the same time. Yeah, that's probably true. So. Anything else? Uh, no, I, I mean, I, 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 
I, I agree with Endos on the, I, I've called it, you know, the Toyota needs to hedge its position. And there is still a lot of risk in, in EVs. Um, we, did a, we did a big report um, earlier this year talking about, um, you know, the risk from resources um, and that, you know, you could have, you know, you have a situation where there's, there you get into a lithium deficit and at the same time, you know, you're going to have strict EPA rules. You're going to need those hybrids to rely on. And, you know, other makers could find themselves between a, a rock and a hard place. So, you know, I, I think what Toyota's, you know, what Toyota, Honda are doing with uh, continuing to do hybrids, it's a, it's a great hedge on a very uncertain future. All right. Great. Let me take a question from the floor quickly. We have one from the online viewer. Uh, Yusuke Anomaikawa, who is uh, from the Argus Media. His question reads, uh, Toyota is gearing up for all solid state batteries, uh, development for EVs. Uh, those are gonna come uh, around the 2027 uh, timeline, let's say. Uh, do you think that they will become a mainstream technology? And uh, if so, how soon do you think they will override uh, lithium ion batteries, today's common EV batteries? And uh, how soon will they become basically mainstream? And what is their potential? I can, I can say a few words for, oh, okay. Just, just, you know, just my view is that um, it's great Toyota's doing the work on, on solid state. You've got a number of other makers that are doing the work on solid state, but it's still, it's still kind of a, it's still kind of an unproven, it's still kind of an unproven technology. Um, you know there are you know there are big issues you know difficult issues with solid state you know in you know it seems like Toyota's got the issue of dentrites under control I assume since they're using a sulfur uh, technology that they've got the uh, um, the issues of, of um, hydrogen sulfide gas under control I assume that you know the hard part is going to be manufacturing at scale but what I think is important though is Toyota's talking about several other battery types that are going to be coming sooner and they're breaking this up into you know an idea of an affordable battery and a performance battery and it sounds a lot like you know um, segmenting the market like you know you've got sport cars with V8 engines or pickup trucks with V8 engines or you got economy cars with four cylinder engines that are quite affordable so, um, you know, Toyota's recognizing that there's going to be quite a variety of, of different, of different um, techno, you know, types of vehicles out there, and they're preparing for it. I think the fact that they can develop their own batteries is an important competitive advantage against others who just have to use battery makers as suppliers. Um, and the solid state, when it comes, you know, it's been, you know, the promise has been out there for, for a long time. You know, that sometimes you can cynically joke it's the technology of the future and always will be. But, um, you know, in, you know we, when and if it comes and it becomes affordable, yeah, that'll be a great asset to, to it. But you got to cover the ground from here to there first. So uh, Toyota recently had press conference with Idemitsu <coughs> regarding this solid state battery. And uh, I, I must think that probably they are now getting uh, very close to the mass production uh, 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 engineering uh, uh, level of the, of the solid state. I mean, as far as solid state is concerned, the most difficult thing is that the, the how to make a solid state battery on mass production basis, not just in the inside the lab, but they have to obviously produce millions of solid battery uh, to sell. And that's the most difficult uh, area. But uh, by listening to Aidamitsu, they seems to be kind of finding the right uh, uh, solid state material, material, materials in which, in which both Toyota and Aidamitsu have almost all the patents in the world. So those two tags, tries to tag, and, and tries to come up with a mass produced based technology. Well, I think there is a pretty good chance, but I'm not really engineer at this point. Frankly, I really don't know if solid state can ever take over lithium ion battery. I mean, I mean, probably there are going to be a different type of the batteries available for this type of the uh, models, like in small cars, for this uh, medium-sized sedan, or this uh, full-size pickup trucks. Maybe we are talking about different type of the uh, batteries coexist. 
at the same time. And that's probably you know, more natural way to think. Uh, but one thing is that almost everybody is trying to come up with better and, and cheaper lithium ion batteries by investing lots of money and investing lots of money to uh, build all those uh, new plants in the United States, China, and elsewhere. If solid state turned out to be turned out to be better in terms of return investment and performance at the same time, then there is a very good chance that the lithium ion battery could be legacy, could become legacy, and which is a game changer for those makers with, with you know, established and better technology and profitability at solid state. That's the, that's what, that's the reason that we you know, frequently call solid battery as possible game changer in the near future, as far as this uh, uh, battery is concerned. Well, again, some people say already uh, current lithium ion, uh, that's obviously liquid. And then we are talking about solid state, that's a solid state, yeah. And then we are already talking about the next stage of air battery, right? Uh, instead of lithium ion battery, uh, nitrogen, uh, uh, well, not, uh, not nitrogen, natrium uh, uh, battery. That's also uh, underway uh, to become kind of mass pro on, on the mass produced level. So. Probably, again, it's not really zero against 100. We probably going to have 20% of this and 30% of this and 40% of this, something like this at the same time. But again, if solid state really turn out to be the best among those things, then that's going to become, that's going to become the majority of the, of the usage by all those different makers. And that could give, again, a game changer type of the uh, uh, no, turnaround in, in this battery business. We don't know yet, but I think there is a possibility, yeah. All right, thank you. So we're, we're running short on time here. We're coming close to the closing of our session today, but we have a couple more from the, uh, from the online viewers, and uh, we'll try to get through them all. Uh, if Maybe we'll, we'll do a, a speed round here, and if you can give some succinct answers to the couple questions, maybe we can achieve uh, all of them. The first question has to do with uh, China. It comes from Etienne Balmer from uh, the uh, AFP French News Agency. Um, the question is, uh, Chinese, uh, sorry, Japanese automakers are really suffering in China. Their sales are down dr dramatically uh, in recent, uh, uh, since the COVID. Uh, especially this year, how long-term trend is that? How can they reverse it? Also, uh, China is set to overtake Japan as the world's biggest auto exporter this year. Um, what does that say about uh, China's coming of age on the global stage? Is it uh, kind of seeing a, uh, replacing Japan as like the world's uh, automotive engine? I have two thoughts on, on that. I'll be, I'll be quick. Um, the first one is it's just not the Japanese that have lost share in China. It's basically every foreign legacy automaker that has lost share. Um, the table that I've got on the screen shows that. And actually, probably of the foreign legacy automakers, Toyota has been one of the ones that's seen the least damage in terms of share loss compared to you know the likes of Volkswagen, GM, Hyundai, Kia, Ford who have seen their market share completely melt down in China over the last three years. So, um, you know, it's not, it's not just, it, and it, I think it largely does reflect, you know, the coming of age of the Chinese motor industry and the sharp movement to EVs in China where you have, you know, some, some very potent competitors there like BYD. The, the second part of the question. Oh, about the export. Uh, oh. Uh, yeah. yeah, well, I think, well, you know, I think the only thing is, is becoming the world's number one exporter has led to trade tensions. And it's kind of reminiscent of what happened to Japan in the 1980s, when they started to export a lot of automobiles. And you just can't go on exporting forever because people will stop you from doing it. How did the Japanese solve that? They started building a lot of factories overseas. And if you look at overseas sales compared to exports, they build overseas four times more what they, than what they export. So, you know, still, you know, so, you know, you know, all, all due respect to the Chinese industry, but, you know, the, the idea that the, um, the exports can continue ad finitum just ain't going to happen. Okay. Well, in China, a uh, long time ago, actually, Suzuki decided to get out of the Chinese market, and which was followed by Subaru. 
and then uh, recently Mitsubishi decided to get out. So at this point, practically speaking, there are already only three Japanese brands still selling their vehicles in China, Toyota, Nissan, Honda, only three. Uh, well, Mazda is selling a little bit, and recently they have uh, been facing a very difficult time, like 40, 50 percent volume decline. There is there has been a kind of rumor that even uh, Mazda might decide to get out of Chinese market. So really, we are talking about Toyota, Nissan, Honda. And each of those three companies have somewhere between 20 and 30 percent of volume, in, volume dependency on the Chinese market. Now, I would say their market share will continue to shrink uh, because uh, obviously uh, no, uh, they are not really uh, a strong player in the battery EV business, while all of three are claiming that they are going to, or they are ready to start selling uh, a market, a whole bunch of new uh, battery EVs, but again, uh, a little bit uh, kind of no, late uh, uh, commerce might not really have a good chance to take over Chinese locals at this point. And then at the same time, as far as this battery EV market in China is concerned, it's actually the government instructing to uh, uh, increase the market share by 2030. And they want to see at least half of their market to be dominated by the battery EV and later on maybe very close to 100, who knows. So if that's the case, it's going to be all those kind of incentives provided by the, uh, 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 by the local and central government and their strategy and their policy to bring all those local or Chinese makers to come up uh, 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 on, on the kind of global stage, so to speak, by boosting the volume in China by those battery EVs. So if that's the case, actually Japanese are not really competing against all those players, local players in China, they are competing against Chinese policy maker, period. So if that's the case, then I think it's kind of naive to believe that all those Japanese are going to start coming back and take more market share. Well, that's probably will not really happen. If there is any exceptions, then could be like Lexus, very high brand image still exists, and a majority of the Lexus are plug-in hybrid. And if that's the case, maybe Lexus along with BMW and Mercedes, and even, even GM is now trying to expand their market share with Cadillac in China. So as far as this kind of top market, luxury market is concerned, that's probably one exception. But other than that, maybe Honda or Nissan could continue to see their market share uh, and continue to shrink. Maybe they are not going to get out of the Chinese market completely, but at least their presence and dependency on the Chinese market might be a lot smaller than it is now. That's probably the case. Okay. Very good. And uh, we have one last question from the online viewers. This is from uh, Sayumi Take from the Nikkei Asia. Uh, it has to do with the Japan Mobility Show, so we'll bring it back to the starting point. What kind of exhibits or stands or uh, concept cars are you most excited about uh, th about this year's show, and uh, what do you think stands out uh, uh, special about this show and uh, as a symbol or as a, uh, highlighting the, the turning point or the, uh, that we're at with the Japan industry here? Well, uh, recently the Japanese, well, recently Sony and Honda Venture, the Nohira, came out with their newest uh, vehicle, which it kind of uh, specializes uh, and uh, demonstrates demonstrate their soft-defined vehicles and uh, came up with a whole bunch of kind of software-related uh, contents. And that's probably one area that Tesla has been very successful. And then at the same time, the majority of the Japanese are trying to uh, uh, do the same uh, in, in the uh, future uh, models to come. And that's probably one area that we really want to take a look at. What kind of contents, what kind of software, and what kind of new, not really hardware type, but software type of the uh, business model they are trying to introduce in those, those uh, uh, you know, shows. That's one point. Obviously, uh, uh, Twitter is now going to uh, uh, show, show us uh, for the first time, uh, they are what they call third generation uh, battery EV, which is uh, supposed to be equipped with this solid state, and for the first time. So that type of the new type of the battery EV that those, those car players uh, uh, are likely to introduce, that's probably the second area. But again, uh, we are talking about 
not Tokyo Motor Show. We are talking about Japan Mobility Show. Uh, I still don't know the difference between Motor Show and Mobility Show, but <laughs> they try to kind of expand uh, the, all those uh, uh, players, um, participants in that uh, uh, show, uh, so that it, maybe they want to keep all those attendance uh, of more than a million million people or whatever. <laughs> Uh, they uh, try to keep the status of the Tokyo Motor Show as high as possible, maybe. That's, that's probably the reason. But again, uh, outside of those, those hardware type of the business model, what kind of newcomers in the area of connected, in the area of cyber security, in the area of over the air type of the uh, business? Uh, I think there are going to be a uh, lot of startups and new type of the business model that we are probably about to see. So. My tastes are kind of similar to Endosan's. I'd probably put, I want to go over to the Toyota and Lexus booths first. I want to see what's going on with the new platforms and, you know, any hints they'll give us about, you know, about timing and uh, about more details about what they're going to do. Um, the Afila booth is uh, exciting. Uh, I'm kind of interested to see if, if, you know, Honda can take advantage of this in any way to redefine their automotive division, which is sorely lagged in profitability for over a decade now. I think it's truly the low-hanging fruit at Honda, and I'd like, to, I'd like to see how they could possibly change their game plan. And then just finally, I want to spend some time at the BYD booth and see what they're doing, you know, see if they have any new things to say about their approach to the Japanese market. Okay, very good. I might also add that it seems that the Japanese uh, automakers are really focusing on a lot of sporty concepts this time around. Uh, everybody seems to, uh, many automakers, I should say, seem to have some kind of sports car concept that they're going to float, an electrified sports car concept. And uh, despite this being a mobility show, whatever that means uh, with a futuristic uh, twist, they seem to kind of rooted in the idea of an uh, exciting motor show being uh, driven by fast cars and sporty, sporty looks. So uh, that's kind of, a, uh, kind of a turn back to the motor shows of yesteryear. Um, with that, I guess, are there any other last minute questions from the floor? Yes? One, one, oh, okay, we'll I'll take one more question from the floor. Go ahead. So the, oh, go ahead, you have the microphone. Yeah, so your now. take on that, and if you think even other Japanese OEMs are chancing, you know, uh, on giga casting, and what are the challenges they could face, and what is the possibility of them trying to introduce giga casting into their manufacturing process? Thank you. So just to repeat the first part of that question for the people online who didn't have the microphone, the question was, did, did you, the analysts uh, attend the recent Toyota presentation about giga casting and their new manufacturing techniques? Uh, what do you make of all that? Well, uh, needless to say, it was not really Toyota, but Tesla started this Giga cast with their uh, all new uh, Model Y at, at, at the Texas plant uh, and the Shanghai plant now, and they seem to be spreading that uh, technologies uh, elsewhere. Uh, Toyota uh, seems to be uh, kind of studying this uh, for a long time, but finally decided to apply uh, this technology on their uh, this third generation uh, battery EV, possibly from 2026 or 2027. Again, we are talking about this completely new type of the platform starting from 2026 or 2027, and not all, but at least some of the new battery EV is going to start utilizing this gear cast. Now, they are talking about gear cast to be cheaper. And then at the same time, probably more productive because just one time of the uh, uh, sampling gonna gonna come up with this uh, finalized products instead of welding all those 50 different parts. That's what they're talking about, right? Now uh, this gear cast uh, requires huge investment, and then at the same time, the die cast of this neutralized in this gear cast is hugely big, hugely big. In the United States, well, Elon Musk doesn't really care because in Texas or California, they have a lot of lands and, and uh, uh, all those traffic and, and, and road conditions probably doesn't really uh, prevent all those uh, utilization of uh, uh, gear cast. But again, in Japan, where land is very limited and the road condition is very kind of poor, <laughs> then uh, uh, moving this uh, huge cast from one place to the other is, is really troublesome. So uh, 
uh, all those, no, Toyota is going to start making all the battery, not just in Japan, but also in the United States and China, and probably some, somewhere in Asia and so on and so on. So in those areas, probably they might be able to uh, do a lot uh, of all those gear cast related. In Japan, even in Japan, they are now thinking of uh, putting some of the you know, couple of gear cast uh, uh, pressing uh, uh, technologies uh, in some of the plants. So again, we are talking about Toyota selling 11 or 12 million by uh, 2035 or 2030, and out of it, uh, 3.5 million going to be battery EV, and then out of 3.5 million, this new type of the platform are going to be about 1.7 million. So 1.7 million, maybe not really 1.7, maybe 1 million only, or maybe 1.5 million, out of 11 or 12 million could utilize this gear cast in 2030. That's what we are talking about. Maybe not those small makers who just going to produce 200,000, 300,000 of battery EV probably doesn't really justify in terms of return investment uh, no, by, by, you know, to, to use this gear cast. We are probably talking about all those big players with huge volume who might be able to spend so much money uh, to come up with new type of the production system, including this gear cast. The giga casting is also controversial among you know among many makers because one because of the capital costs and also because of the huge energy the huge amount of electricity to create that much molten aluminum, so you know that you know the, I think there'll be questions about about that as well, um, you know not just in Japan but in Europe too it's controversial. One European maker told us giga casting solves a problem we never had. Well, very good. I think we've come to our close now. Uh, I'd like, as uh, we usually, uh, uh, as a sign of a token of our appreciation, we usually give the guest speakers these, these honorary uh, uh, guest memberships to the club. So I'd like to give uh, our thanks to uh, Koji Endo from SBI Securities and to Chris Richter from uh, CLSA Securities for coming in today. And um, let's give them a round of applause. Thank you. Chris? Thank you. Thank you. All right, I think that concludes today's uh, presentation. Thank you all for uh, coming, and uh, thank you for tuning in on online. Thank you. All right. Okay, thank you very much.